Tommy, welcome to the show. Hey, hey, thanks for having me. So uh, you're probably the first guest that I've had on that I would trust to actually advise me on how to make coffee. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, I hear you're a Chemex guy and, you know, I'm more of an AeroPress person, but you have to sell okay. me on the Chemex. How do you do it? So I... Uh, I have all of the, or at least most of the necessary paraphernalia uh, to, to do this properly. So I have an induction heated gooseneck kettle where I get my um, my water to 205 degrees Fahrenheit, which is on the warmer side. You could go a little bit cooler. Is this like um, the, the fellow or whatever it's called? Uh, it's not the, the, the stag fellow. I have actually one made by Chemex called the Chettle. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, it would be the same thing. And you can dial up the, wa the, the water up and down. And then obviously um, fresh ground beans. I have, uh, I use a, re a reusable metal filter um, mm -hmm. rather than a paper filter, which I really like because um, there's just something like some of the, some of the oils and flavors and like just like this tiny amount of uh, the granularity that you get. So similarly, if you did it in a French press, you get a slight, you get a very different texture of coffee. And I, I like that. And I like the flavor profile better. So I use that in my Chemex. And then it's 16 uh, to one water to grounds by weight. So I usually do two ounces of coffee, 32 ounces of water. Um, and obviously, and I, and, I, and I weigh both. So I, so I have my Chemex on a scale as I put the water on. Um, you can get really uh, in-depth with the total brew time so how long you know you know and how slowly you pour the water i'm still working on optimizing that uh, but mm -hmm. everything else um that that's 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 essentially my the first part of my morning routine um is sort of brewing all of those things grinding the beans and putting it together so is it just the flavor profile of chemex that you enjoy or is it the fact that you're getting sort of a larger filter uh, versus an espresso i'm just curious how you arrived at chemex yeah, so so I, I used to do all of my coffee in a French press because I, I preferred that um, to most other um, brewing methods. Uh, but this and th but then I sort of as I upgraded things, I decided to try the Chemex and then try this metal filter. And I think it's a really nice balance um, between the different ways to do it. I don't I'm not a big fan of espresso. I like a big cup of black coffee where I can really sort of taste the coffee and try various different beans. So it's it's the way, you know, it's just it's, it's the yes, yeah, mainly the flavor profile that I end up getting out um, that I just really enjoy with it with a with a pour over. <laughs> All right, Decoding Superhuman has become the barista show today. So <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, let's jump into a few things because I, there's so many topics that I could cover with, with you. And so, um, you know, I love a lot of your, your recorded talks and one of them you did on genetics. And there's something in there that you said about the problems with nutritional epidemiology. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hoping we can get into that a little bit specifically, you know, why you're you're skeptical about it um both nutritional epidemiology and genetics mm -hmm. so to start i guess if we start with nutritional epidemiology um the the main reason i'm skeptical of it is because it's complete trash science I mean, it's, <laughs> it's it's just <laughs> it's just a hundred percent nonsense mm -hmm. um and and the reason for that is that it's really hard basically impossible to get people to accurately tell you what they eat mm -hmm. um and no matter how you do it uh i guess the two most common or, or well-known studies based in the u.s there's those run out of the uh, harvard school of public health by walter willett and frank who so that's the uh, health professionals follow-up study and the nurses health study and they do a yearly um food frequency questionnaire where you just get this huge list of foods and then it says on average over the past year how much did you eat and that's like how many tablespoons of heavy cream did you have per week for the past year like i'm not sure i'm gonna that, remember that for last week right unless you no, exactly <laughs> exactly and so it's like that for literally every possible food um mm -hmm. and then the the other one is the enhanes and what they do is a 24-hour dietary remove call so they call you up and they say, what did you eat yesterday? And you tell them. And then they say, how typical is that of your normal diet? 
like, do you eat more or less of these various things? And that's it. And, and, then, and then they take that data and then 30 years later, they say, oh, because this person had two more tablespoons of heavy cream on average per week over the year that we asked them, they're more likely to get heart disease, which is, <laughs> I mean, and when you think about it, it is absolutely insane that we think that this is reliable data. And what's really nice is that people have actually looked at this. And so there's a couple of um, uh, papers published looking at the quality of the NHANES data. And basically, if you look at what they report, um, more than 60% of reports, uh, the cal like the calorie, the total calories reported are incompatible with that person being alive. Um, so one example- so Too is, low or too high? Too high, like they're underreporting by up to 50% in wow. some cases. Okay. And then like, so, so like, even if that half is correct, you don't know what the other half of their calories are, which is gonna make a huge difference. So, so one example is a very well cited study uh, or paper uh, published in Cell Metabolism in 2014, looking at protein intake and mortality risk. Uh, mm -hmm. And they sort of, then they specifically said that if you're under 65 and you have high protein intake, then you have an increased risk of uh, both all-cause mortality and cancer mortality. And so when you look at their data and it's hidden in a table in, in the supplementary like information for the paper, and this is based on NHANES data. If you look at the, you, you look at the sort of the demographics or, um, you know, the anthropometrics of the, of the, of the people included, and they, they were supposed to have, it says underneath that BMI is on the table, but it's not, but there is waist circumference. And if you go by waist circumference um, for um, sort of like the level, what you would expect in terms of obesity, on average, these people are obese mm -hmm. um, or at least close to it, certainly overweight. And in the high protein group, which is the one where they're saying, because of this high protein, you're going to have increased risk of death. They are reporting 1500 calories per day on average. So they have definitely <laughs> underreported by 50% or more. Yeah. And in the US, what are those 50% of calories going to be? They're going to be refined carbohydrates and fats. It's not because they ate, you know, they're not underreporting their lean chicken breast, right? Yeah. Um, and so, and you know, this, this is the quality of the data. And this is what we're using to say, hey, if you eat more or less of this, this is going to be your health outcome. Um, and we just do not know the majority of what people are eating in these studies so there's just there's no way there's no way to to understand this and and people again like walter Willett and frank who will say oh but we verify that this is gold standard by doing blah 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 blah. but you know once it's out in the wild and once you're doing this on a, on a, on a population size basis this stuff just doesn't work um yeah it's it's terrible and, and so i imagine that and i, I kind of hinted that we're going to go into genetics here you kind of have similar feelings about genome-wide association studies in the sense that it's just massive populations and you're kind of searching for a needle in the haystack which may not exist yeah i think you know we we had this um you know over the past 20 years we've had this increasing um obsession with our genetics and it's been both on a on a on thank a you craig Venner, right <laughs> <laughs> on, on a population level as well as, you know, this was going to be the key to personalized medicine and, and all this kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. what, you know, when you look at this and it, it kind of depends on, on what you're trying to achieve, but when you look at this in terms of say standard health outcomes, like what are we worried about on a population level in terms of population health? And we're worried about people being overweight and obese, you know, having high BMI and BMI is a sketchy way to look at it, but that's the way it's reported in studies. Mm -hmm. And maybe, you know, types of diabetes or, or fasting blood sugar, you know, and, and when, you, when you look at um, even polygenic risk scores, so, so basically you, sort of sift your way through all of this information and you find X number of single, single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs associated with an outcome. So say it's weight or BMI. And like the current state of the art, uh, I believe is 141 SNPs all used, put into an algorithm to try and predict uh, your BMI. Mm -hmm. And as your polygenic risk goes up across these 141 SNPs, yes, your, your average BMI goes up but including all of these genes, it only expl explains 13% of the variability in BMI, which basically means that 87% is driven by the environment. Mm -hmm. um, and like, then when you look at individual genes, you also see 
um, similar effects. So like FTO is probably the one that people have heard, heard of, right? In terms mm -hmm. of BMI or being obese, um, uh, fat mass and obesity associated protein. And when you look at um, individual populations, so again, they've looked at this in the US, if you, uh, FTO is only associated with an increase in increased risk of or higher BMI or increased risk of obesity in the post-war era. So before we had the, you know, the modern obesogenic environment, these things didn't even matter. Mm -hmm. So again, like even the genes that are associated with the outcome, you know, it's an interaction between the gene and the environment and the environment is what drives almost all of the risk. So when we spend all this time vacillating about FTO gene means we should do X or eat less saturated fat, which is like just crap science multiplied by crap nutrition, nutritional epidemiology. We're just like completely missing the, the forest for the trees. And, okay. and, or the, the, and, the, um, and then, you know, similarly in our kind of world, in the biohacking world, we would get like super uh, focused on something like MTHFR, yeah. right? <laughs> You're, you have, um, you, you know, and the language is things like your MTHFR doesn't work properly, right? Yeah. That's the, that's, it's that's the fear mongering, right? And yeah. Just... And it really is. And so 85% of people have an MTHFR um, gene or protein that doesn't function properly, right? So mm -hmm. then all of a sudden, so like the average person has a, re has a reduction in function. So, mm -hmm. so automatically you can't say it's not working properly because that's just part of the normal distribution. Mm -hmm. Then when you look at how these things interact and you look at something that you might care about, like your homocysteine level, like your MTHFR um, function, like almost has no relation to your actual homocysteine level, despite what Chris Masterjohn will tell you about how much choline you need to eat for like your given X percent decrease of MTHFR Ooh, function. Like, the it's choline just, calculator, I know that yeah, one. Yeah, <laughs> which is, whew, yeah, and the- Go um, for it. Yeah, so, I put my, my, my information into the coding calculator and mm -hmm. I actually have, I'm, um, I'm, he I'm heterozygous for both of the major SNPs mm -hmm. in MTHFR. And what's nice about the fact that there's two SNPs is you can kind of see how they interact in terms of function. So I have more than a 50% loss of function. Um, and because of that, I need to eat twice as much coding, uh, supposedly, but the study that is used cited in the calculator to say that I should eat twice as much choline is a study looking at folate deficient, uh, 13 folate deficient uh, Mexican American men. And even in that study, eating more choline didn't affect methylation status, right? Mm -hmm. And then, then the fact that it's a small study, it's poorly controlled, it's not relevant to me. It's of people of a different ancestry. And we, and we know that ancestry plays a big role. So if you have an FTO SNP, but you're black, then it doesn't have an effect on your weight, but it does mm -hmm. if you're white. So, right, all of this stuff comes into play. And like, then there's, the, then there's the fact that the main assumption that's made in the coding calculator is that if you look at the people with the most significant um, decreases in function, then they, they assume that there's a linear effect in terms of like, here's the people with 100% function, here's the people with 25% function. There's, a, they, there's an assumption that there's a linear, a linear requirement across MTHFR function and coding requirement. Mm -hmm. but those people who have a very that, that one specific SNP, they're just completely different. And actually you can overcome all of it with a very small dose of riboflavin and the effect isn't linear at all. So like all of the assumptions that go into the calculator are just 100% nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, now that doesn't mean that coding isn't important, right? I'm, I'm a brain researcher, coding is very important for the brain, but just like when you boil it down to these very simplistic things, all you're doing is causing fear mongering that really isn't based in science. Mm -hmm. So this is, I mean, it just goes back to the whole idea that the reductionist approach to anything is probably not the, the right way to go, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so going back to genetics, before I get into the overarching question of are these useful or how they can be useful, there's one that, <laughs> talk about fear mongering, APOE, and mm. sort of APOE and the saturated fat connection. And you mentioned saturated fat er slightly earlier. Um, Curious to your thoughts about that, especially since my understanding, uh, at least historically, is that we evolved from an APOE4 variant, but I may have that wrong. Yeah, no, that that's right. It's it's the oldest, it's the oldest variant from when we climbed down from the trees, um, essentially. And mm -hmm. it is, you know, your APOE4 status, 
is is probably one of the few genes where I think like an individual SNP is associated with a certain outcome. So particularly mm -hmm. for Alzheimer's disease, uh, but also potentially cardiovascular disease. But the effect is quite small. So it's, it explains about your APOE4 status, explains about 5% of the variance in your outcome with mm -hmm. respect to cardiovascular disease and Alzheimer's disease. So it, so it has a meaningful effect, but relative to all these other things, uh, I think the effect is quite small. Mm -hmm. um, however, it does seem to be associated with a slightly more inflammatory, quote unquote, inflammatory phenotype. And potentially uh, there's an interaction with saturated fat. Um, however, I don't think that's necessarily, that means that if you are APOE4 heterozygous or homozygous, you should avoid saturated fat. Mm -hmm. But I think um, it's, it's, so, it's somewhere where maybe you have to make, you know, just like a, a, pay a little bit more attention. Uh, mm -hmm. to things and I, I think that that's worth that's always worth thinking about um however again in the, in the grand scheme of things um the, the effect is is very small and if you look at the age of onset of alzheimer's disease in apoe4 homozygotes versus those who are non apoe4 homozygotes so that could be apoe4 heterozygotes or you know various combinations of twos and threes mm -hmm. only about a third of people with who are apoe4 homozygotes are diagnosed with alzheimer's earlier than you would expect to be diagnosed if you had any of those other yeah. ones so in my mind then there's only a third of people who who are apoe4 homozygotes who have like a significant penetrance of that genetics right because you know then the other two thirds are diagnosed in a time that fits the normal distribution of people with other combinations of APOE. So uh, so there is a significant effect, but it's probably smaller than most people um, say it is. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also interesting stuff like, if you look at the Bolivian Simone, uh, who are a hunter-gatherer tribe who've been studied very intensively uh, in terms of their health outcomes, because you know there aren't that, that many where we've been able to sort of like go in and study things. And of course, like, Anytime you go in and study something, you you're going to change it. But this this is this is sort of the way we look at it. And in that group, um, if they have a high parasite burden, which either you know you see the parasites directly or they have an eosinophilia, you know, high eosinophils on a blood test, mm -hmm. and they have ApoE4, either you know heterozygous or homozygous, they actually have a protection of cognitive function. Yeah. So there is a an interaction between the environment and the gene and what is expected. And I think you know, the, my, and my personal approach is to try and sort of use, you know, take some information from what may have been, uh, you know, your ancestry, the environment that you evolved in. And I think the APOE4, like people who have APOE, APOE4, um, they just, you know, they will likely, or potentially, they will potentially have um, a greater detrimental effect from like the environmental mismatch that, that mm -hmm. we're exposed to in terms of diet and sleep and stress and all that kind of stuff. So again, I think, you know, it's, it's possible that those people may just have to pay a little bit more attention uh, to their lifestyle in order to, to make sure that they don't see the negative effects of that. Mm -hmm. And so for people out there who are either have already spent money on like a 23 me or something like that, um, or uh, have invested a lot of time kind of perusing, I, I guess, Prometheus was sort of the database that I went to okay. originally, um, mm -hmm. you know, what kind of useful stuff can we get out of this? Is there anything we can get from a performance perspective or is it pretty, pretty much genetic disease driven? Yeah, um, there's not very much from a 23andMe report that I find particularly interesting or particularly yeah, useful. The, the ancestry one is kind of, <laughs> it's just like boring in a way. It's, yeah. It depends on um, where they cut the borders. Yeah, yeah, exactly. and. And, and I, so I, I think there's there's some potential, and this is obviously where 23andMe will make most of their money is with their deal with GlaxoSmithKline to, yeah. to do better pharmacogenomics. That's kind of, that's been the whole uh, business plan all along, right? Yeah. Selling two, selling one $200 genetic test is never going to be a long-term business plan. So mm -hmm. from the the SNPs in say the size grown people 50 enzymes and how you metabolize different drugs that's probably one of the areas where um the evidence is strongest for mm -hmm. an effect and i would say you know and i certainly think that that could be beneficial for you know dosing and personalizing you know when you're going to be taking medications you know like knowing like 
whether you should take more or less of something because you know it's going to change its half life based on a given snip and that you know the deep the the data there is reasonably good and so then that may affect your cat right your cap 2a1 your caffeine metabolism yeah. right so are you a fast or slow caffeine metabolizer i think that there's some potential potentially useful information there i certainly if you're a slow metabolizer you know less caffeine earlier in the day certainly is probably going to have an effect on sleep mm -hmm. um and then also there's an increasing amount of data looking at um, caffeine metabolism and then whether you respond to caffeine as an ergogenic aid uh, in sports performance. And those who are fast metabolizers seem to um, respond better to caffeine as an ergogenic aid, uh, sort mm -hmm. of if I had to pick one sort of broad outcome. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's it's bad for the rest of us. So I'm a, I'm a, I think I'm a heterozygote for that. So I'm a moderate mm -hmm. metabolizer. Um, so that's probably the area where I think this data is, is potentially useful. But when it when you're looking at disease risk, um, you know, obesity, type two diabetes, you know, and 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 the problem is that most of the data you get directly from 23andMe, they've done it through subjective questionnaires or you know, sending people yeah. questionnaires. So, like when I learn that I'm a moderate caffeine metabolizer or, or whatever, then 23 and tells me that I have I'm more likely to drink more caffeine. Mm -hmm. what does that mean that literally means nothing that's just because you ask people of, you know <laughs> about their about you know they you know what their what their genotype is and then you ask them about their caffeine drinking habits that's not mm -hmm. useful to me um and so that's what and then there's other stuff like oh you have this so you're more likely to move in your sleep like pff, like really like what is <laughs> how is that useful but yeah. but this is like sort of it, it gives you the it gives the um the illusion of useful data, which, which is not really meaningful, and obviously mm -hmm. that's because their their uh, their business uh, is is elsewhere, and they have whatever it is a, a few million genotypes. So they they have enough to then do the other stuff that they want to do, and so they don't really care about giving you meaningful data. So, have you seen any of these sort of um, online genetic diet calculators that are even worth their weight? Because I find, mm -hmm. for instance, the single SNP analysis of like whether or not you are a high or low fat diet um that just kind of irks me a little bit especially if yeah, there's not the, an apoe yeah there's so there's no evidence to support those whatsoever um okay. and when when you actually look at people who've tried to examine this um you might have so there's there were the food uh the food for me studies uh, based in europe so they they looked at giving targeted nutritional interventional advice so it was uh fto reduce saturated fat um mthfr uh increase um it was increased folate and and you know all that kind of stuff and when they look well there are two important outcomes one is that when they when they looked at people who got the different advice basically being told about your genetics doesn't affect your behavior and that mm -hmm. is is that is reflected across multiple different studies. There was a mass analysis that came out a few years ago that showed that again. And then equally, even in those people who got the advice, it didn't really make any difference in terms of any of the things that they measured. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then there's then there's the, uh, another example, like um, Chris Gardner's diet fits study, uh, yeah. where they randomized people either to low fat or carbohydrate, uh, both generally improving diet quality. And then eventually people were allowed to sort of iterate their way into something they felt that was sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, and then they looked at, you know, supposed low fat or low carb genotypes in the two different groups. And basically, regardless of your genotype and the diet you're randomized to, everybody lost the same amount of weight. Um, mm -hmm. So so again, like there was, a no, and there were no other sort of biomarkers that suggested that because you have a low fat genotype meant that you did better on the low fat diet there's really no evidence to support any of that so any of you know so um i'm trying there's the um, so i, I can imagine like, i'm just wondering there's a flip side risk factor here that if you tell somebody mm -hmm. that you know they have apoe or i mean the mthfr one's still my favorite uh, you tell somebody that they have dopamine issues and then they just kind of become neurotic right and just yeah it, I can and, and, it causes more harm than good in this case yeah and you know what you tell people actively affects their physiology so there's a great so so on the on the dopamine front uh there's there's a great quote from uh, robert sapolsky which says that um thinking that you have the warrior genotype which is uh, comt so how fast or slow do you metabolize dopamine oh. will have a you know thinking that you have that genotype will have a greater effect on your physiology than actually having it. Um, and there's there's loads of very nice information 
and, and studies that show that telling somebody they have a specific genotype, even if they don't, directly affects their physiology. So there was a study where they took people, they put them on an exercise like treadmill test. Then they told them either you have the good copy of the aerobic gene or the bad copy of the aerobic gene. The people who were told they had a good copy when they redid the test, they did just as well as they did before. The people who were told they had a bad copy, they did less well on the exercise test because they've just been told that they have um, that they have you know poor aerobic genetics. And again, like no evidence to support that. But if you tell somebody that they have poor genetics, you will negatively affect their physiology. So like there's almost you know, for most of these things, particularly from the direct to consumer side, there's almost no benefit, and there's you know, uh, potential for significant harm. I'm just, I guess it's not, you said that it's not the flip side of the positive. So in my future kid's life, I can't like secretly say like, Hey, you have good genes, even if they don't have good genes and then potentially make them into a professional athlete. Right. doesn't quite yeah. work like that. Uh, un unfortunately we, yeah, the, unfortunately it, it and, and it, well, it could actually be ha the language that we use. So if you change yeah. the language and you were like, your genetics are amazing. This is going to, you know, this is going to mean that like when you're playing basketball, you're going to beat all the kids, you're going to outrun them. I think there's possibly like, you could possibly see something there, but yeah. in general, the way we talk about genetics is like either you're normal, either you have MTHFR function of hundred percent, which only 15% of people do, or you're abnormal. Right. So you can't, so like there's only po there's only possible like there's only possibility of being worse yeah, yeah right but like everything is either normal or bad mm -hmm. which again like isn't doesn't make any sense uh in, in normal physiology so if you change the language and so there's one example where this potentially happens in in that same study where they did the aerobic test and told them about their genetics or randomized them to tell them about their genetics they also did it with the fto gene mm -hmm. and so they said to people like you either have like the good version or the bad version of the FTO gene in terms of, you know, you're less likely to be overweight or more likely to be overweight. In the people who they told them they had the good copy, less likely to be overweight. After a standardized meal, the second time after they told them, uh, and again, this is regardless of, the, regardless of their actual genetics, they had higher uh, GLP-1 signaling and greater satiety from, a, from a, uh, a single meal. So being told that they had the genotype that was protective against gaining weight, they got, you know, they got more satiety from a given meal. Uh, and you saw that in terms of satiety hormone signaling. So that was actually a benefit of saying, do you know what, you have the protected genotype, they were, they were going to feel more, you know, full after a meal, and then, then over time, they might end up, eat, you know, eating less or having better satiety regulation. But that's, that's the one example that I have uh, of a benefit of being told uh, cool. about your genetics. I might have to use this one with Thanksgiving dinner table with some of my family <laughs> members, but... <laughs> I uh, want to transition here, Tommy, to something that it, I've just kind of delved into the research a lot lately, <laughs> what exists of the research. And I'm kind of curious how you look at just sort of the world of cannabis, because mm. uh, the research is, to my understanding, somewhat limited, mm. um, but also some of the ways that the research is conducted is by surveying clinicians and sort of getting the effects from clinicians. and. Uh, for somebody like you, how do you look at cannabis and sort of how those studies are done? Um, and what, what needs to change other than the schedule one being dropped in order to learn more about it? Cause it, I mean, you hear a lot of practitioners using it, particularly in California, West coast, um, mm. and here in Amsterdam, but you know, how, what do you think about cannabis and what can we do to make the research a little bit better? Yeah. I, I think that, the, the problem with the way that research that you mentioned in particular is conducted is that we can't really extract any meaningful information from it in reality. And, and this is something, so, so, I mean, the first step of any, of trying to answer a scientific question or, you know, um, develop a hypothesis and then test it is, is this kind of stuff. So you, 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 you um, generate either pilot data or you, you know, you collect what is currently known and so that is an important first step. Um, mm -hmm. However, it then requires actual testing. And, and what you see across all the different realms of health-based research is that, you know, when you when you have one clinic or one group of people who who use something because they believe in it, first of all, you're gonna get a strong placebo effect. Mm -hmm. Second of all, it's uncontrolled. So you don't have anything to compare it to. And as you know, 
the um, the classic Voltaire quote is that the art of medicine is entertaining the patient while nature cures the disease. So yeah. you 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 basically you have this thing that you you tell the patient is super important, right? They get a great placebo effect, and then you know they keep coming back and you keep working on them, and then over time they're probably going to get better anyway. But you as, you ascribe it to the intervention that you put in place, mm -hmm. um, and so that's where I think a lot um, you know a lot of that positive data is coming from. And it doesn't mean that I don't think there isn't benefit there. It's just that that's that's all that you can say from the quality of data that exists. Mm -hmm. um, when you're then isolating individual compounds and want to test them, right? So the, the majority of my work is testing neuroprotective compounds or potentially neuroprotective compounds in animal models of brain injury. That's, mm -hmm. that's kind of, that's my bread and butter. And so there is a lot of interesting inf um, you know, data on CBD, say, if we just going to isolate one component yeah. as a neuroprotective agent. And we have tested it in our lab or we did in the lab I did my PhD and actually didn't see much. Um, however, there are other labs that have seen benefit and I'm not gonna say that we did the right science and theirs is wrong. So I, I think there is a, a potential benefit, say of CBD, it's also used in pediatric epilepsy and high doses. I have a colleague who does that and you know, uh, sees some, some interesting benefits. So, mm -hmm. so in, in that respect, I think we're kind of at the point where the animal data is probably good enough to suggest well, then we then need to go into clinical trials and mm -hmm. those are being done but you know we don't really have the outcome data to suggest yes in, in this specific setting say cbd is neuroprotective um mm -hmm. and at the same time um we there's a huge you know sales push for this stuff already yeah. to suggest that it's beneficial and like there's some potential downsides there because you know, it's already being taken up it's already being sold people are using it um, and there's really no evidence to support that so in athletes cbd is supposed to improve recovery but really like there's no good data um on that yeah i kind of think like cbd just kind of looks like bitcoin was a couple of years ago in terms of mm. a bubble although yeah. i mean bitcoin's making a little bit of a resurgence right now but and i mean if there's no what what's going to prick the bubble that is cbd I mean, is it these clinical trials coming on? I mean, how do you get the clinical trials ramped up faster in a way? Yeah, it, it's really, so, so I think that you are just like the, um, the psychedelics uh, for mental health research, you know, uh, the, there's always going to be a bit of pushback when, um, you know, these components uh, you know, come from something that is a, a schedule, a scheduled drug yeah. um, with, uh, with, I mean, CBD is probably a little bit easier because you can get it from hemp oil. They've changed it such that as long as it's less than 0.3% THC, it's not classed in the same way as cannabis. So like there's been some movement that's mm -hmm. going to potentially allow that to happen faster. Um, but in reality, you've basically got to rely on researchers being interested enough to convince whichever NIH study section they submit their grants to that, you know, this is going to be worth 10 or 15 million dollars to test uh, in, in a certain intervention and so like, there's only so much money to go around so mm -hmm. you know if we may be particularly interested a bit in cbd but there could be however many other compounds and however many other diseases that also require um some investigation so you know unfortunately this stuff is is always going to be fairly slow moving because that's sort of the nature of the beast in terms of like how what, what's the total pot of money available what are the total number of diseases to look at and then the mm -hmm. number of different interventions um and so that's always going to keep things fair you know fairly slow or slower than we'd like so with cannabidiol you've kind of heard it at least in this bubble that we exist in uh used as sort of a potential sleep agent um mm -hmm. Uh, potentially an anxiolytic, uh, maybe even anti-inflammatory. Uh, mm -hmm. And you mentioned neuroprotective. Of those, are there any that we can just strike out and say like, hey, that it's not possible right now? Or is it mm. or TBD? Yeah, I, I think all of them have a little bit of TBD um, mm -hmm. sort of attached to them. The, the information, the the data that I find most interesting is in, in terms of inflammation in the gut uh, with, mm -hmm. with CBD, because then you don't need to worry about it being absorbed and circulating and ending up in the brain. And bioavailability is pretty much a problem with any, any promising compound, like getting it yeah. to the place where you want it to be. But there's some interesting data in mouse models of inflammatory bowel disease where um, you know a reasonable dose of CBD is, is quite protective for the gut. 
Um, mm -hmm. And so I definitely like to see more of that. Um, and we've certainly had people, again, try it in IBS and IBD and you know they feel like they, they see benefit. Um, again, is that uh, a $3 a day placebo effect? I'm not sure, but if they feel much better and healthier, then maybe it's worth it. Mm -hmm. um, for, for sleep, I'm probably, that's probably the closest to where I, I don't think it's really what people have, have said it, it is. And when they've looked at CBD in, you know, re, so in small doses, it doesn't seem to have an effect on its own in large doses. So we're talking like two to 300 milligrams. It seems to worsen sleep. Um, again, like there's one study in healthy volunteers where it seemed to show that CBD on its, on its own actually, you know, made, you know, made sleep worse, um, mm -hmm. where it has shown benefit with sleep is in chronic or like neurological either pain or neurological disorders such as multiple sclerosis and then it's as something like sativex which has some thc in it so a combination mm -hmm. of cbd and thc in that setting may be beneficial for sleep uh, but again hasn't been tested in like normal healthy participants or athletes or somebody who's trying to sleep better for recovery that's in like specific you know specific neurological or pain-based conditions and then like the combination seems to be important so like cbd on its own for sleep um, i'm i'm not really convinced based on what we know so far mm -hmm. and some of the doses that you just mentioned are not exactly what you get at sort of your local pharmacy cbd yeah. right like it's very mm -hmm. hard to find 200 milligrams cbd uh and, and if it's and if it's high quality that's going to cost you a lot of money yeah of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right so uh, going on from cannabis i want to come into sort of uh, part of what you do um on a day-to-day -day basis and, and to the extent that you're able to talk about this is uh, working with kind of the formula one one world and this kind of group of elite high performers and some of the things that you and i have talked about before is what you can actually do with these people who are at the top of their game to improve performance and mm. I, i'm just kind of curious because you know when you started working with these people there you had a, a big roadmap in terms of what you can potentially do in terms of behavior change and what have you found really effective and what have you found very hard about working with somebody who is uh constantly plugged into let's say the driver's seat if you will yeah so the interesting thing about working with this particular group is that they're probably more like the average person with respect to both their their lifestyle, you know, other than the the jet setting and the incredible financial resources and, and the the, <laughs> the jet lag and I mean, you don't have a Picasso art collection or something like that. <laughs> no, sadly not. <laughs> Although I could probably think of better things to spend my money on. Yeah, but, exactly. Um, the the in terms of the capacity and ability to make change, they're much more like the average person than the people I'd worked with previously, which would be what you know we'd call like optimizers so type a you know high profile high paid job also want to be an international triathlon athlete you know mm -hmm. on the side um, and those people will literally try anything and everything they'll spend thousands of dollars to speak to every expert and try all of it um, and as soon as you tell them to do something they'll do it yeah. um, and it's it's it, it's a nice group to work with because they'll just do what you say, or at least yeah. they'll try it out. Like, well, none of this really sticks long-term, mm -hmm. um, but they'll try it out. But like the vast majority of people, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. and, and so Formula One drivers are actually the same. You know, they have a limited capacity to start making significant change. A, because they have li like limited cognitive real estate to do it, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're just like continuously moving, continuously traveling, they have huge media commitments that then they're in the simulator or they're working with the engineers to improve the car. Like there's just only so many hours in the day. Um, and so what you see is that you're reminded of the fact that picking the low hanging fruit is by far the most important thing. And so you can, mm -hmm. you can see significant benefit in terms of, um, just like moving those big rocks and making sure that they're, that they're moved. And so I think of, um, uh, one, like one example where I was looking at some sleep data and, you know, the, somebody was con like the concerned about their sleep one of the drivers was concerned about their sleep and you just see right like you can get all this fancy data and it was from a, our favorite fancy sleep monitoring ring um, <laughs> and like all these other all you know all this stuff that comes out but like 
you just look at one number is that you're just not not spend not spending more than five and a half hours in bed mm -hmm. you just need to be in bed for longer right mm -hmm. like no other fancy data required yeah um and and so it's things like that and then when you when you sort of shift that and you, you allow that to happen they sort of build in re, you know then you talk about well why is it you're not spending much time in bed you know why is it that as soon as you wake up you want to get out of bed rather than thinking well maybe i could do some things to relax and go back to sleep um so focusing on those things then you start to see really big improvements and again it's just like the the the, the simple things that we know are important and so like mm -hmm. that is even important that is even crucial at the you know the sort of the pinnacles of, of performance um mm -hmm. and you know focus on the things that are most likely to matter because you just can't try and fix everything um and then like the other side uh which i which you know for thinking about lessons learned from working in this arena is that even when um, you know, when you're when you're working with these high performance, like you can look at somebody and say, you know, you're doing absolutely everything wrong and the, and the blood biomarkers don't look great. And like everything that I would say you should do, you're not doing. And yet you can still like function at a level that most humans are just not capable of. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's 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 a reminder that the the human physiology is incredibly robust yeah. uh, and incredibly resilient. And we're often talk like we often talk about these things from a position of frailty, right? Like we talked about like MTH5, it's not working properly. Therefore, you're gonna be, you know, you're gonna have all these risks. But in reality, you know, if you, you know, particularly if you sort of put the 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 body in, in, in a fairly um supportive environment, um, it's incredibly resilient and robust and you know, should be able to handle a lot of these stresses. And we just we talk ourselves into this sort of frailty mindset and i think that's that's where a lot of the, the problems come from we're all, obviously we're always trying to optimize something mm -hmm. at the same time we, we, we're, we're telling ourselves that we're not optimal therefore we're going to have a decrement in performance we're going to be have a you know a, a decrement in our long-term health um and i think that mindset is actually driving sort of a negative effect on physiology um mm -hmm. rather than actually what you know what is actually going on uh in the environment so like those are some of the interesting things that come out from working in, in with that group and, and so, this is interesting the, the element of long-term health is uh, a particularly fascinating topic of discussion in the sense that do you think because these guys are so focused on the near term becoming the next f1 champion whatever it is uh that the element of long-term health and concern of long-term health fades and therefore they're able to do this um or is it is it some other driving factor like i don't know if you want to throw out the purpose word uh but something yeah else. that's a that, that that's a really good question um and and you could definitely think well i mean you could i mean all elite athletes pretty much have to sacrifice some element of long-term health in order to, to achieve immediate um performance and mm -hmm. so like the the tenet is that elite athletes are very fit but they're not necessarily very healthy Mm -hmm. um you know and there's a, you know if i was going to recommend things that somebody do to a, to maximize their opportunity for you know long term health most of the things that the athletes have to do to achieve that given performance i would not recommend um and there's certainly a case of you know to really perform you need to liquidate some assets um and sort of give those up and, and to get that performance but maybe that's going to you know cause longer term problems and so mm -hmm. not being focused on the future i think does allow you to then get these these momentary um elements of performance but equally you know not if, if you had the worry about long-term health and performance you know that that's potentially going to hold you back because mm -hmm. i mean any person who wants to live a long and healthy life with a long and healthy brain is not going to spend a lot of time driving at a wall at 200 miles an hour <laughs> right i mean that's just you know um th th those things probably don't go hand in hand so yeah. there's definitely a certain personality type but but obviously you know the focus on the near term is, is, is going to be a big part of what allows them to, to perform in the way that they do mm -hmm. okay um, wow, this is fascinating. So with with these guys, it, the typical kind of behavior modifications that you're able to do with them, or what are sort of the top three things that you wish some of these guys would change in order to you know, maybe perform five, 10 percent better? Is it sleep duration or is it or a couple of other things? Yeah, so, so I think the the most important things that come up for that like sleep is is always going to be super important particularly mm -hmm. because they're basically in a content except for this year where they've been a bit more constrained in terms of their travel 
they're basically in a continuous state of jet lag um yeah. and like you just so there's no opportunity to establish a normal circadian rhythm so mm. so sleep finding ways to sleep i think is probably for these guys the, the most important mm -hmm. um and then uh nutrition is probably is probably the next one and it's very variable from driver to driver they all have very different um requirements but also interests in mm -hmm. terms of in terms of their nutrition and and so then that gives you a little bit of a, an additional um interesting factor in terms of optimizing this stuff however they're also in a position where they can offload some of it so they so the way that i work with these guys is mainly with their coaches so each of them yeah. has like a body person who is essentially you know if and if you know who they are and then you you watch formula one like they're always next to the car they're always next to the driver like they are there all day every day um 300 days a year sometimes it's like the consigliere um, that does everything yeah, for them right yeah, yeah exactly and so mm -hmm. you know when it's appropriate and you know when the the coach has the interest and the driver has the interest and then the coach may like literally take over all aspects of food right so this is a coach with a master's degree in strength and conditioning and a, and a huge you know the body of of work and experience and like they're the one scrambling the eggs to put in the in the burrito to like <laughs> hand to the driver as they get out of the car because you know if you want this stuff to happen you're going to have to do it and so mm -hmm. you know you know I, I, again i think there's some there's some potential benefit or like because these guys don't have to right they don't have to worry about feeding themselves because mm -hmm. they may have like an incredible chef who just like here are my macros for the day you know go for it right mm -hmm. and then the food just appears so you know offloading some of these worries again i think allows them to to then put their cognitive processes into things that are going to matter more for their performance but mm -hmm. the downside of that or potential downsides are that they're maybe less engaged in some of these aspects of lifestyle that that could be important to, to health and again this mm -hmm. is very variable from driver to driver so like no sweeping statements it really is it's just this is, is a it's a potential um mm -hmm. downside um and then the but then, and then the other one is that you need to work very hard to convince them that something is worth doing because people always want you know these guys to test out their gadget their device their product yeah. um you know so, so you have to show up with some really strong data to say you know this is actually worth your time yeah. and, I, and i think that's a, that's an important thing to do as well because you know we're always like oh you know here's this thing maybe it's beneficial like but when you've got 50 people at any one time who are saying that to you you're going to say well show me why um and then mm -hmm. that's important as a sort of a, as a coach or a consultant or an advisor because then you need to be really certain that there's a high chance of this is this is going to be beneficial before you start badgering somebody to, to implement it and again i think everybody should have that sort of barrier uh of evidence required for you before you start unloading all of this stuff onto people because again yeah. that just becomes its own burden yeah absolutely otherwise you just become sort of an affiliate commission man uh which yeah. is a little bit of what's going on in the world these days uh Let's talk about TBI because you talked about brains going into walls at 200 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I grew up in a day and age with guys like Junior Seau being linebackers in the NFL. And he's a pretty prominent case of TBI related suicide. And you're doing a lot of research on this. And I'm just kind of curious, first off, if we can qualify just kind of what what do we know about tbi in terms of like if you had a particular type of concussion if you had a certain number of concussions should you be concerned and is there a way for our brains to naturally heal themselves in these cases or do we have to take precautionary measures yeah i think there's certainly enough data to suggest that after a significant TBI and what constitutes a significant TBI is going to be very different from person to person uh, mm -hmm. for a number of for a number of reasons. But you can certainly get long term changes in say the the inflammatory state of the brain, um, you know uh, the the general function of the brain, and then the vulnerability of the brain to say future insults. So like you could have multiple concussions and then say you get a stroke later in life. Um, is that going to have a more significant effect or is it going to increase your risk of dementia which certainly seems to be the case and, mm -hmm. and these things in some way i don't know whether they're additive or, or synergistic but definitely the more exposure you have 
certainly the, the, the greater the risk. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you are going to think about ways, so, so say if you, you've had some, some previous concussions or you have some kind of previous injury, um, I think there are a few things that um, could potentially be beneficial. And when I think about what is required to heal a brain, in my mind, it's very similar to what is required to grow a brain in the first place. And so mm -hmm. then this is where some of my work in developmental neuroscience hopefully informs what you might do after uh, an injury later in life. Mm -hmm. So things that I think are important are omega-3 fatty acids, so DHA and EPA. Um, and there's a lot of interest in that. And there, there, there are clinical trials. There are people <coughs> um, who are, you know, recommending you know, very high doses after TBI, maybe 20 grams a day. So Michael Lewis wrote, Holy wrote, shit. wrote That's a lot. Michael Lewis wrote the book, uh, When Brains Collide. Yeah. Um, and he's done uh, a lot of work on this. He has his omega-3 protocol and it's very high doses. And so this is like after the acute injury in people who have significant cognitive deficits. Mm -hmm. um, if you then, you know, take a couple of, you know, a couple of hand, handfuls of a good quality fish oil is, you know, what's the likelihood of there being a downside? It's very small. Um, you know, is there some potential benefit? Yes, because, you know, DHA is required for the, for the normal function of neuronal synapses um, mm -hmm. and mitochondrial function. So there's, 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 so I don't necessarily think that everybody who had a concussion should take 20 grams of uh, fish oil yeah. a day, but, you know, certainly ensuring that these are in the diet, I think is important. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we can certainly get into the weeds if we want, but it, it's, it's not just, you know, the function of the brain itself, but it's also, you know, having these present in the brain in the setting of inflammation helps to resolve and normalize inflammatory processes because they are metabolized into things called pro-resolving mediators or specialized pro-resolving mediators. And so people mm -hmm. may have heard of protectins, maresins, resolvins. These come from EPA and DHA and they help to sort of normalize inflammatory processes after an injury. So it's both useful in the injury itself and chronically, but then also potentially if you are in at risk of a, of a future injury. Mm -hmm. um and and creatine i would put into that bucket as well okay. uh, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of very interesting data on creatine as a neuroprotective agent mm -hmm. um both if you have it on board before and after the injury um and the again the you know all of the things that i'm going to recommend are like super low risk do mm -hmm. i have several randomized controlled trials to tell you that this is going to be beneficial no but you know with this they're so well studied and have such a good safety yeah. profile that i'm very comfortable recommending it to people so yeah. creatine is, is probably the best research supplement of all time yeah um and has almost no real risks and then mm -hmm. has been studied in multiple animal models as well as human um disease you know disease states in terms of improving both mental health and cognitive function mm -hmm. and, and reducing uh response to injuries so that's another one um we obviously talked about um we obviously talked about sleep already and i think sleep again is incredibly important um i would probably have um a lower threshold to recommend somebody take something like melatonin to help establish normal circadian rhythms particularly if they're not sleeping well you know they mm -hmm. have previous concussions and in line with that um i think it's very important particularly if somebody has ongoing symptoms after some kind of brain injury to do a full pituitary hormone check so like mm -hmm. The pituitary, if people don't know it well, is this like tiny little grape that hangs on a stalk inside your brain. And it's where most of the hormonal regulation in the body happens. And it's very susceptible uh, to, to brain injuries. And mm -hmm. so when whenever anybody come, has sort of like come to me or has talked about ongoing symptoms after, after a brain injury, uh, you should just do a full pituitary screen. So LH, FSH, um, which obviously regulates sex hormone production, uh, mm -hmm. growth hormone, TSH for thyroid. Um, and, you know, you, you can often see decrements that either appear over time or they may happen early and then resolve, but it's just those things are always worth checking. And mm -hmm. then um, particularly if the pituitary isn't asking for enough hormone, then maybe you need to think about how to replace that. Mm -hmm. um, the, other, the other two sort of nutritional things that I think are potentially beneficial are blueberry anthocyanins. Um, okay which which i think are very interesting both because they may have like a direct pharmacological effect so some of the blueberry anthocyanins or berry anthocyanins seem to inhibit uh, matro uh, matrix metalloproteases so these are enzymes that are produced in the setting of injury that 
um, basically break down the extracellular matrix, but also decrease the integrity of the blood-brain barrier. Mm -hmm. um, and then also there's there's some studies uh, looking at these in the setting of both pediatric, uh, you know, or, or in kids or in adults with mild cognitive impairment, and they seem to maybe improve uh, both acutely and chronically uh, cognitive function. Uh, and maybe also, uh, like if you look at um, neuronal activation on FM, uh, um, fMRI in the setting of a, of a memory task, there seems to be some improvement. So it's basically like a cup of wild blueberries and like the wild blueberries that are blue, small and blue in the middle, not those big fat things that they call blueberries in America. Like who knows what they are. <laughs> that, that you so get like, <laughs> with, with just our Safeway or something like that. It's probably not. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So like a, pro a proper wild blueberry. Uh, and again, so like, what's the worst that could happen? You just had a nice cup of blueberries every day. Yeah. Um, and then, then the final thing is choline. Mm -hmm. and, and again, like obviously choline forms uh, part of the backbone of the phospholipids that, that build essentially a brain. Um, and there's been a lot of interest in CDP choline, particularly, so citicoline in the yeah, setting you, of traumatic about, brain injury. And you also hear about that in the nootropic world quite a bit, right? And so it's... Yeah. Um, and they've actually, there, there, were, there was a study, I think back in the 70s, where they compared paracetam to citicoline wow. in the setting of traumatic brain injury and citicoline had a had a better overall effect but it was, it was mm -hmm. a very it was a very i mean it's a very small study mm -hmm. um you know and most of the studies that do show benefit are again fairly small so like comparing seven people with concussion on codeine versus seven people with a concussion on placebo mm -hmm. um so there does seem you know again it's one of those low risk high potential benefit um uh, supplements mm -hmm. um the largest trial to date, uh, the COBRIT trial, uh, basically compared traumatic brain injuries of a, of a wide range. They had to be hospitalized and they gave them two grams of codeine a day and actually didn't see benefit. Uh, but the problem with that particular trial, and this is just if people are looking at it, the problem with that particular trial is that less than 50%, I think 44% of people in the choline arm got 70 or took 75% or more of their doses. So basically, more than half the people in the trial didn't even get a dose. And so that's mm -hmm. maybe one of the reasons why they didn't see anything. So mm -hmm. like those are things where, you know, if people, particularly if people uh, you know, think they have either a risk or some kind of cognitive deficit um, uh, after concussions or TBIs, uh, then, you know, DHA, creatine, uh, blue brown cyanides, choline, uh, potentially, exogenous ketones um oh that's a and, that's an interesting one okay what, why yeah. exogenous ketones let's jump into that yeah so it's uh, a great question again it comes back to what it to um how you build a brain in the first place and mm -hmm. you so you could potentially go on a therapeutic ketogenic diet you know if people want to try that that's great and some people you know anecdotally report that they see benefit there and there are also clinical trials of this currently ongoing um, the easier way to do it, although potentially a much more expensive way to do it is with exogenous ketones. So I don't think that the source of the ketones matters. Um, but when you look at neonates, uh, who are, who are actively trying to grow a brain, they are at least for the first week of life. And then intermittently for weeks and months after they're born in a state of ketosis. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's either because there's M there's MCTs, medium chain triglycerides actively made in breast milk mm -hmm. to encourage the production of ketones or because you know, in the fasted state, they go into ketosis very quickly, like within a few hours. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because ketones are the preferred synthetic precursor for fats and cholesterol in the brain. Mm -hmm. So if you give a developing brain either glucose or ketones, the, the ketones will go into synthetic pathways and the glucose will go into energy metabolism. Now, of mm -hmm. course, the brain can also use ketones for energy metabolism, but the ketones specifically seem to be um, preferred for synthetic precursors so if you're trying to build fatty membranes and put cholesterol into it then and most of that is synthesized locally in the brain rather than coming from the circulation then ketones seem to be um a, a very uh seem to be the preferred source mm -hmm. so I, I think that that's one reason why again if you if you think there's some risk or some cognitive deficit or you're trying to recover the brain then then i, I think ketones are potentially going to be beneficial the other side of that being that the brain really doesn't like high spikes in blood sugar, uh, particularly yeah. acutely after the injury. Um, but, you know, I would also say that if you have a vulnerable brain because you've exposed it to these, these traumas previously, then trying to keep your blood sugar under control uh, or at least avoiding, you know, multiple large spikes every day is probably going to be beneficial as well.
Okay, so there's a few things that I want to dissect here, but the, let's yeah. start start at the beginning because there's a number of people listening to this, uh, myself included, who were sort of at a younger age, much more competitive athletes. Like the last mm -hmm. concussion I had was 18 years ago. I spent a night in the hospital, but the information that we had on TBI back then was not very much. And I, or it could also be the doctor that I was working with at the time. Right. And so is there a certain qualifier that you would go through as kind of a working professional today who had childhood brain injuries that would say like, Hey, this is something I need to pay attention to. Is there like an amount of concussions, sort of the types of concussions? Is there anything that we can do around that? Um, I think that's, it's really difficult to put um, sort of like a definition on there just because again, that data doesn't necessarily exist. So like we're, we're just in the last five years, maybe really starting to appreciate the effect of early life concussions, multiple yeah. concussions. Um, and so, you know, I'm working now with, um, ex, you know, experts in say pediatric concussion who have large clinical databases of kids who had concussions. Um, you know, and just now they're starting to develop the data of like, um, you know, the severity, how they interact, what it may, may how it may affect uh, long-term neurodevelopment, uh, what's the effect of other environmental exposures. So I'm particularly interested in uh, babies who are born preterm, which is mm -hmm. often, often associated with um, a change uh, or sort of inflammation at, at the start and may affect development of the brain. And then what happens if those kids who function, you know, normally, the majority of them, if they then play soccer or football and get a concussion later in life. So mm -hmm. we're only just starting to put that data together. Mm -hmm. um, however, there's definitely an increasing appreciation of, um, you know, particularly, so if you think of, if you think of kids and uh, TBI is still the, the most common cause of death in the U S in kids aged like zero to four, um, wow. as well as later in teenage years. So it's very common. Um, and then obviously like there were kids, you know, the majority of kids don't die, but you know, they fall and hit their head and then yeah. what happens the years after. And, you know, there's definitely an increased, um, risk of, you know, behavioral or mental health, uh, disorders, uh, in these kids, cause they you know, took a bang so, so early in life. So, you know, when you have a history of that and you start to see these things, then I think you, then you can say, well, you know, maybe, you know, maybe the brain injury is a part of that. Mm -hmm. um and again like what would you then think about doing you know it's it's all there are plenty of nutritional and lifestyle strategies you can start to put in place none of which are particularly onerous yeah. um and again like i can't you know there's no huge clinical data set to say yeah, this is definitely going to be beneficial but you know so putting those things in place i think are, are certainly worthwhile um so it, so again it's, it's very difficult to say yes because this happened you're going to have a, you know, you're definitely going to have this or, you know, you have some kind of noticeable deficit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, however, you know, people who are really interested in this, obviously there are um, a, a number of cognitive tests and tasks and things that you can try out on yourself. And certainly if you want to put things into place, um, you can then see whether things improve. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of subjective quality of life. Uh, you yeah. know, and if somebody is having trouble sleeping or they have, you know, brain fog or, you know, any of these other symptoms and they have a significant history of concussions, then I would probably in a, be in a position to say, yes, these are at least part of that. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, again, you know, think about putting some of these things in place. Okay. This is awesome, Tommy. Thank you uh, so much. So uh, before we kind of move on into what I like to call the, the final four questions, because uh, look, I, I want to talk to you again, but I know cognizant of time that I don't want to take your entire day, especially because it's busy election day. Um, <laughs> but um, barbecue, mm -hmm. completely unrelated topic. And at some point, we're going to have to get do an in-person challenge because I have a bit of a barbecue history myself. Uh -huh. How did you pick it up and what's sort of your... Are you talking grilling? Or are you talking low and slow on the smoker kind of thing? Yes. So I, I must admit that right now I am more of an accomplished barbecue eater than a than a barbecue producer. Okay. Um, but but certainly when I've I have learned that when um, what I called a barbecue in the UK is what should be called grilling, 
Yes, um, very, very, very true. <laughs> and and definitely not what barbecue is in in the US. So I uh, I can I can put together a pretty decent um, slow cooker pulled pork mm -hmm. um, that that you know at least I can get Southerners to eat. Um, like so, my wife's family are all from North Carolina, which you know North Carolina barbecue is like whole whole oh, hog vinegar pork, sauce too. Pork. Yeah. Yeah. And which actually I really like. I much okay. prefer like the vinegar, vinegar sauces or mustard based sauces are certainly my preference. Ah. Um, but <laughs> I saw a little well, bit of disappointment uh, yeah, in your face. It's, <laughs> it's just like I grew up. So you don't know this about me, but I grew up competing in barbecue and probably have a more oh, cool. accomplished barbecue resume than most things I've ever done in my life. Uh, but I, I grew up doing Memphis barbecue, which is a little bit different. So hmm. I, I mean, look, I can appreciate a good Carolina sauce when I find a good Carolina sauce. <laughs> <laughs> but so, but I, but I will say um, that my personal preference is mm -hmm. brisket. Like okay. I could eat good brisket all day, every day. And this is one of the, this is one of the main benefits of uh, working with Formula One is that every year, well, not this year, but every year, uh, the US Grand Prix takes place in Austin. And oh. so I get to go to Austin and basically eat brisket for every meal for three days uh, or five days b b before I fly Austin, home. Austin's certainly a great place to find brisket too. Like Texas yeah. makes the best brisket. I can't, can't hold a candle to them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So going into the final four questions now, think of these as kind of rapid fire, just fun questions, if you will. Uh, mm -hmm. What's your top trick for enhancing your focus? Is it your Chemex coffee or something else? um yeah the the top trick that i have I, I learned from a friend of mine called james hewitt who i also know through hints of working with the formula one drivers which is basically um avoiding what he calls cognitive middle gear so it's just avoid it's essentially the avoidance of multitasking mm -hmm. um if you can get rid of all all these other things that are trying to just dis distract your attention which basically results in you doing lots of poor <laughs> Poor quality work mm -hmm. which actually and there's an analogy in um training or any kind of training particularly endurance training which is that most people spend most of their time in middle gear which is just thrashing themselves around lactate threshold which mm -hmm. has the, the biggest effect in terms of um like physiologically demanding on the body with with the smallest return in terms of performance and so um the cognitive middle gear middle gear is the same and if anybody's interested in that i definitely recommend looking him up but that's that's the Basically, eliminating multitasking, uh, which I was never any good at anyway, is is the best way to improve that cognitive mm -hmm. performance. Favorite book, or actually, let's reframe that book, which has most impacted your life. Um, I think just because of all um, just the the amazing things that I learned about uh, humans and animals from it is probably "Behave" by Robert Sapolsky. I, I, oh. It hasn't hasn't been beaten yet um and just so much you know, if, if you want to know about where why humans behave the way they do and why most of the things that we're concerned about really make such a small difference um then definitely read that it's an epic tome i will say that and very dense but just fascinating you know i've had it sitting by my bed for a while and just because as you say it is an epic tome it's been one of those things that i've been delaying it was actually recommended by greg who was the guy who connected us but oh, yeah. Uh, yeah but i uh after this i'll have to start picking it up and see how we go with it what excites you most about the health world right now um i think what what i think is excites me and is hopefully going to pan out is the increasing focus on helping people change behaviors mm -hmm. um and because we we know and i know as somebody who spends most of my time giving people information about their health um i know that giving people information is not what improves their health um it's actually supporting them to to make those changes uh, which is very difficult Mm -hmm. particularly in the environment that we exist in so there's a big focus on behavior change which is actually finally starting to include experts in behavior change rather than just some tech kids from stanford saying oh yeah i can solve <laughs> behavior change by and shortening just, your feedback loops <laughs> yeah and, and just failing massively because they mm -hmm. don't understand the problem um so so that i think 
is, is definitely something I'm excited about. And then the other thing that I'm excited about is the fact that there's an increasing focus on um, diversity and inequity, particularly in health data. Mm -hmm. um, and so like when I'm looking at polygenic risk scores and they've removed all the data from non-white people because it makes the polygenic risk score less accurate, like immediately I just, it, I just, I'm so frustrated. I throw my hands up it's in the air. Infuriating, and like, right? It's in, it's absolutely infuriating. And these, and you know, in, in general, if we think about the U.S., the U.K., other populations, the people who require this the most are, are the people who you're removing from the data set because they make it less accurate. I mean, mm. it's just it's just insane. It's, and it's just I've, I've basically said before, and I've gotten some pushback from it, but I believe in it that when you do this you're in, essentially encoding racism into science, right? Yeah. Because you're just, you're propagating these inequities. Um, and so it's from a health data standpoint. So again, like most of the, if we think about cardiovascular disease risk markers, they were developed from the Framium cohort in, in uh, Framium, Massachusetts, which is essentially all white people. And then yeah. when you look at those biomarkers, they don't predict cardiovascular disease nearly as well in black people or people from uh, of other heritages. So like <laughs> all the data that we have just, isn't relevant to, to, to this huge section of society who are also, um, you know, have far less privilege for, for many other reasons. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really happy that, that people are starting to um, focus on that. The, the one potential downside, which still has a lot of work to be done is that, you know, we, we look at demographics when we're, when we're trying to analyze health data. So we'll, we'll say, you know, how, how do you identify, you know, it's black or Hispanic or, or white or, or something else. But the problem is that when that's the only major identifier that you have and you put down this into a statistical analysis, what you risk doing is saying that um, race has a distinct biological effect on health, which mm -hmm. it doesn't, right? Yeah. And there's lots of data to, to show that it doesn't, but uh, if you don't do it correctly and, and acknowledge the fact that the reason why being black is um, you know, associated with a, with a worse health outcome is because of the sort of distal societal problems rather mm. than because there's some health effect of being black, which for most healthcare problems is absolutely not the case. You know, so we, we just have to be really careful about how we analyze the data mm -hmm. uh, because you can also, again, start to sort of encode these inequities and, and assume that it's an effect of race when in fact it's an effect of society. Um, so I'm really excited that people are starting to focus on, on that as well. Um, and, and I think that's what you know, I kind of moved away from some of the, uh, elite performer world I mean I still do some of it but I, I'm doing less of that because I think the people who need this the most are the people who don't have the privilege and the money um, to you know immediately change their environment um, and and so that's that's where I'd like to focus more of my efforts amazing Tommy we didn't even get into blue zones and resistance training and <laughs> there's so many topics that I can go down wormholes with you on um, where can people find out more about you um the the best place to probably come is instagram that's where i probably post most frequently so i'm at dr tommy word on instagram um i have a website uh, drragnar.com r-a-g-n-a-r um mm -hmm. which hasn't been updated for a while but there's some old blog posts there and when the rss feed is working then when i post on twitter and instagram and stuff it, it pops up there and there's there's also usually a like a list of all my publications and stuff if people are interested in those kind of things very cool Tommy, thank you again for coming on. This has been such a fun conversation. I'm sure we're going to have yeah, to do it again and do it again soon over some brisket. <laughs> yeah, uh, we'll have coffee and brisket. There Perfect. you go. It's an interesting combination. Maybe split out over <laughs> brisket is for breakfast. Now. Over a day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you, sir. I really appreciate all your time. Thank you.